Okay, thank you, Della. Nice to see you. Oh, <laughs> I recognize many of your faces. Nice to people come back again. If you see them once, they never come back and they become Christians afterwards, uh, you know there is a problem. <laughs> you missed an opportunity. So great to see you. Hello, Desiree. Hello, Daitri. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so, um, uh, welcome to the, this little retreat. It's only going to be four days. Yeah, four days go so fast. Before you know it, it's gone. Uh, so just enjoy yourself for these four days and just kind of, uh, you know, uh, just relax from the very beginning and just enjoy yourself. Don't think that because it's four days, uh, you have to get your money's worth. So you really have to meditate really hard. Uh, if you think like that, you don't get your money's worth. You actually lose all your money because you have a lot of suffering, a lot of pain, a lot of problems. Uh, so much more, if you want your money's worth, uh, enjoy yourself. Uh, relax, take it easy uh, and enjoy this beautiful uh, little retreat center here in Kaduri. Uh, it's always remarkable. I always thought Hong Kong was going to be a very bad place for meditation practice. Uh, but actually, when you come to a place like this, it actually is quite nice because it has the natural environment around. Uh, it is quite peaceful. Uh, what was that, that um, General, all that shouting down here? Was that the PLA shouting this afternoon? Did you hear that? Uh, didn't hear that? It was kind of noisy. No, no. Could be the PLA. <laughs> okay. So apart from, apart from the... Liberation, People's Liberation Army, exactly. Yeah, yeah. so they get a bit of noise from them sometimes. But uh, otherwise, it is actually very nice and peaceful. And this is the kind of environment you want to come to to do meditation practice. Uh, someone was saying, because everyone wants to have their money's worth, uh, it's good if we can have more talks. But the, remember, the point of uh, the Buddhist practice is actually to <laughs> have. Uh, to have that mixture of peace and meditation together with the talks. Uh, if all you have is talks, then you actually lose the opportunity to use a place like this to its full potential. Uh, yeah, the potential here is to become peaceful. Uh, the potential here is to relax. Uh, the potential here is to allow the mind to calm down uh, and to enjoy yourself. Uh, and the idea is to then to use that potential is really what this is about. Uh, so it's good to have a nice balance between talking and meditation. Yeah? So if you don't like all the talking, you don't have to come to my talks. Yeah, isn't that good news? You don't have to come here. You don't have to uh, come to anything if you don't like. You can stay in bed all day if you want. Uh, that's okay. Yeah, some people do that. Uh, and that's fine. The most important thing is that you just have a good time and you relax. Uh, and when you are finished with this retreat, uh, Ideally, you should feel much less stressed out than you have than you did when you came here. Like you, you might still have a bit of stress now, perhaps. Uh, everybody says life in Hong Kong is very stressful. Uh, yeah, and uh, I'm sure it is. I have no doubt about that. Uh, so just learn to unstress a little bit, unwind, uh, and relax. And if you do that much, uh, already you're already heading in the right direction. Uh. So this schedule here is like a suggestion. Uh, Follow it if you find it useful, uh, but everything is really uh, voluntary. Yeah, C come to whatever you like. Uh, Ajahn Brahm always says there are only two things that are compulsory on the schedule, and I think Della said that before, only two things compulsory is breakfast and lunch. Uh, yeah, everything else is voluntary. Yeah. <laughs> is that good news? Uh, that's kind of my kind of retreat. Yeah. <laughs> So then you learn to find that ease. And this is so important in meditation practice because many people get it the wrong way around. And this is what I have learned from Ajahn Brahm. Is anyone here who has not heard of Ajahn Brahm? You have to live in a cave to not have heard of Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> So um, this is the way he teaches meditation practice. And one of the things I want to show you on this retreat is that the Buddha also teaches meditation in pretty much the same way. And this is one of the things that I always found very powerful. You, you want to check that your teacher teaches in the right way. Yeah, you can't just think that Ajahn Brahm teaches in the right way just because he's your teacher. You should actually check it out. You should have a little bit of a critical faculties to make sure it actually is right. And the way to do that is to go back to the word of the Buddha. What did the Buddha say here? Does Ajahn Brahm teach in accordance with the word of the Buddha? And if he doesn't, what do you do? You go to say, Ajahn, listen, the Buddha says this. You say that. Uh, okay, explain yourself. Uh, yeah, that's what I do. That's how you get very uh, unpopular with your teacher in the beginning. But after a while, you kind of get a good relationship with your teacher. So that's why I've stayed with Ajahn Brahm for almost 25 years, close to 25 years now. Uh, so quite a long time. Uh. So the purpose of this retreat is to have this mixture uh, of teachings of the Buddha on the one hand uh, and meditation on the other hand. Uh, 
And these things, this is a very powerful combination if you know how to use it right. Uh, because if you do have some success in a meditation practice, uh, if you do find that you become more peaceful, uh, the sutta has become much more meaningful to you as a consequence. Uh, because you can take them on board. Uh, yeah, the quiet, the peaceful mind is the mind which kind of has the potential for wisdom and understanding. Uh, so if you do uh, become more peaceful, the sutta has become more meaningful to you. And when the sutta has become more meaningful, uh, they actually tend to turn your mind in the right direction. Uh, because this is the word of the Buddha, it gives you the instructions that are required. It gives you the outlook, the understanding of the world that is required to make meditation possible. So the right outlook then enhances your ability, ability to do your meditation practice. So the two things always go hand in hand. Yeah? Suttas on the one hand, meditation and practice on the other. This is always how Buddhism is supposed to work. So. Um, this is kind of the idea behind these kind of retreats. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I have always found in my life as a monk, or even before I become a monk, is that uh, very often we hear lots of teachings uh, in Buddhism. Uh, but the one thing that we always miss, of, not always, but often miss out, is actually the word of the Buddha himself. Uh, yeah, you get to hear everyone else, uh, except for one person, that's the Buddha. Uh, is that kind of strange, yeah? You get to hear this teacher, this Sayado, this Bhante, this Master, this, this Aya, yeah, and this, whoever they are. But the one person you don't really hear so much about is the Buddha. And yet the Buddha is the root teacher of everyone. Everyone in the whole history of Buddhism, it really comes back to the Buddha. And there's something very powerful and beautiful about these teachings. And I would like, hopefully, I will be able to inspire you a little bit with these teachings of the Buddha. So you feel, you know, you feel this kind of sense of uplift. You feel the sense of profundity. Here is something by which you can even live your, your life. You can find meaning in your life in a very much deeper way than you would be able to otherwise. These are very beautiful teachings. That's what I have found after reading them uh, for 25 years or whatever. Uh, so uh, this, is, uh, this is what uh, this idea behind this retreat. Uh, and uh, uh, that is all I will say about that now. Uh, what I want to do next is to give you a basic introduction to meditation practice, uh, just to get the meditation going. Uh, and then uh, during the retreat, I will give one guided meditation uh, every day. Uh, and the idea is just to remind you of the instructions, uh, remind you of the ideas. Uh, so there will be one guided meditation in the evening at uh, 7 o'clock, uh, usually, uh, and then Q&A afterwards. Uh. So what are the basic principles of meditation practice? Uh, uh, we have one late comer, Della, uh, one person coming here. Uh, so uh, we'll invite them in before we uh, continue here. Uh. Okay, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Please take a seat here. Very good. Uh. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, and uh, to understand meditation practice, uh, always I come back to the suttas, back to how the Buddha taught this. Uh, and there is one sutta in particular, there's a number of suttas, I'm gonna do the suttas I'm going to talk about these here are very practical things, uh, all about meditation practice really. Uh, uh, but there's one sutta that has always kind of struck a chord, me, chord with me uh, when I read it. And it's a sutta which also Ajahn Brahm often emphasized in his own teachings. Uh, and also it is a sutta which the Buddha himself emphasized. Uh. So when I say the Buddha emphasizes a sutta, what, do I, what, what does that actually mean? Uh, and what it means is that uh, if you find a certain sutta, you find it repeated many, many times, many, many places, uh, yeah, again and again, uh, uh, maybe in slightly different variations, because uh, uh, the Buddha never gives the same teaching in exactly the same way, there's slight variations in these teachings. Uh. And then you find it maybe in the Chinese, yeah, Chinese Agama translation, the ancient Chinese. Uh, you may fi find it in the Tibetan language. Uh, you find it in Sanskrit, perhaps, uh, all, in, all in these very ancient languages. Uh. And if you find a suttas like that, that you find again and again and again, obviously it must have been something the Buddha emphasized uh, because it taught it in so many different locations and places. Uh. And uh, this particular sutta is uh, 
uh, is found in the what is called the numerical discourses of the Buddha, uh, and it shows you the, if you like, the psychology of meditation. Uh, yeah, when I say psychology of meditation, what I mean is how you are ideally supposed to experience meditation yourself. Uh, yeah, so how sh what should meditation feel like when you do it? Uh, this is what this sutta is about, uh, and. Um, the way this sutta goes, I've taught it many times before, you will, some of you will recognize it straight away. Please don't yawn when you recognize the sutta. Think, oh no, same sutta again. Because actually, every time you hear these things, this is the idea, it will hopefully go in a little bit deeper. This is kind of the idea with it. So often, repet repetition is actually very useful. And this particular sutta, it starts off with uh, sila. Sila being morality or kindness or, you know, your character, if you like, uh, all of these kind of things. Uh, uh, and so it starts off with sila and you build that up. Uh, and when you build up sila in the right way, uh, the consequence of that is that you start to feel good about yourself. Uh, yeah, if you live well, if you live with kindness to the people around, around you, uh, if you treat people by body and speech and all of these kind of things, uh, then uh, uh, after a while you start to feel a sense of integrity, uh, a sense of goodness by, with yourself. Uh, you have nothing to feel bad about because you don't do bad things, uh, and you have lots to feel good about. Uh, so you have no remorse, you have no regret. And when you think about your life, you think, yay, I'm living, living well. Uh, is that how you think? Yeah. Yeah, do you think like that? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm living pretty good. <laughs> That's the right way. It's not. This is not an ego trip. Yeah, yeah, I'm really good. Yeah, these other scallywags, but I, I'm much better. It's not like that. It's just that you feel good about yourself. You know that you're living well, huh? and that is actually a source for happiness. Uh, and this is uh, uh, from that comes the happiness, which is the very beginning of the meditation practice. Uh, yeah, so this shows you, and I will talk more about this later, it shows you the importance of sila. Sila is a Pali word which means morality or virtue or a development of a positive character and all of these kind of things. It shows you the power of virtue at the very beginning of the Buddhist path. Then, because you feel good about yourself, yeah, welcome, please come in, yeah. <laughs> So because you feel good about yourself, you feel happy. And from that basic happiness, you build up the happiness more and more and more. Uh, according to the sutta, from the non-remorse comes the pamuja. Pamuja means like gladness. Uh, from the gladness comes the piti, the rapture, yeah, the f often physically felt joy in the body. From the rapture in the body, you get the pasade, which is the peace and calm. From the pasade comes the sukha. Sukha is even more happiness. Uh, from the sukha comes the samadhi. Samadhi, which is the deep meditation that uh, you, we are all basically aiming for on the Buddhist path. Uh. Yeah, and when you look at that, this is what I say again, it's the psychology of meditation practice. Uh. Now, if you look at that psychology, uh, it's pretty positive, yeah? Gladness, rapture, uh, calm, happiness, uh, and then samadhi. One thing after the other, all very happy states, uh, all very, very positive. Uh. So this is what Buddhist meditation is about. It's about something. It's a movement towards happiness, a movement towards more contentment, a movement towards all the things that we actually want in our lives. Is there anyone here who does not want to be happy? Anyone who would like to be more depressed? Yeah? If, you'd like to, if you really want to be more depressed, no point to be here. Yeah? Go back home straight away, because this is not the place to be depressed. So this shows you that the purpose of Buddhism, and of course this is what we're all seeking for in our lives, we're all seeking for a contentment, some happiness. Why do we always run after things? Why do we work so hard? Why do we get into relationships? Why do we try to build up all of these things in our life? Well, really, in the end, it is because we are seeking for some kind of happiness and contentment, a movement away from suffering. Yeah? That's what it's all about. And here you have this path which points to exactly that. And this is one of the reasons reasons why the Buddhist teachings are so powerful, uh, because they give us exactly the thing uh, that we are looking for. Uh. So I love uh, this particular sutta, I think it's so beautiful and so powerful, uh, and, if, and the very fact that it was something the Buddha emphasized so much uh, makes it even more powerful in my mind. Uh. So this is the starting point, and of course once you have that as your background information that it is all about happiness, uh, it already gives you a lot of guidance on what you are supposed to do. Uh, so if you sit down and you have a lot of pain and you have a lot of problems, uh, are you going to get much happiness out of that? Uh, 
Probably not. Yeah, if you sit down and you think, yeah, I'm going to kind of bear all the pain. I'm going to grit my teeth and press the tongue against the roof of my mouth, and I'm going to sweat, and I'm really going to force myself to sit. If you do that too much, uh, you're never going to get that inner happiness that the Buddha is talking about. Uh, yeah, so it already gives you a lot of information right there. That what you have to do is to find, uh, uh, you know. With all the things in your meditation, whether it's the posture of the body, how you deal with your mind, whatever it is, it has to be something which can possibly give rise to a sense of happiness and contentment on the, uh, in the practice. If it can't give rise to that, if it gives rise to the opposite, you know that you have a problem. Yes, yeah, so already it is very, very useful. So um, that is the background. It's like the overview of what meditation is about. Uh, and I'm going to talk now a little bit about some of the simple, basic ideas that actually arise out of that and actually make this happiness uh, happen uh, in your meditation practice. And the very first thing that I always bring up on these meditation retreats uh, is the idea of the middle way. Uh, you know the middle way? Uh, yeah? Anyone who does not know the middle way? Uh, is anyone who is a complete beginner in here? So I heard someone was a beginner. Is there any beginners in here? One over there. Have you heard about the middle way? You have. You're not a beginner then. So you must be already already <laughs> starting out. Okay. Because um, the middle way, and this is sort of the interesting thing about the Buddhist teachings, is that the idea of the middle way is the very first teaching of the Buddha. Yeah, the Buddha reaches his awakening, yeah. then he goes out and he thinks to himself, who should I teach next? And this is already very interesting. The Buddha thinks, who should I teach next? And I think, oh yeah, these people, they have died, too late to teach them, they have already passed away. Uh, but the five ascetics who supported me here, yeah, yeah, they are the ones I will teach first. Uh, why does the Buddha think that? He thinks that because he has a gratitude. They supported me, because they supported me, yeah. I will teach them the Dhamma in return. Yeah. That's already interesting, isn't it? Here's the Buddha. The Buddha has gratitude. Yeah, the Buddha acts upon gratitude. So the idea of gratitude is a very Buddhist, profound Buddhist idea, ideal that we should all try to live up to, because that's how the Buddha works. So when you see the Buddha, how he, how he lives his life, that is actually an example for how we should live as well. So remember that. The Buddha is not some kind of far away deity or anything like that, that you can't model your life on. The Buddha is a flesh and bones human being just like us. And when he does things, uh, we should live in the same way. Yeah. This is a, actually a very important principle uh, according to the, for, uh, that you find in the early suttas, uh, because very often the Buddha will talk about his own life, and the purpose of that is to inspire us. Uh. So he goes and teaches these five ascetics. And the very first teaching that he gives to the five ascetics is the teaching of the middle way. The number one teaching yeah, in, all, in everything that he taught. And despite the fact that this is the number one teaching that, uh, of what the Buddha taught, uh, how many people actually follow it? Uh, very few people follow it. Uh, isn't that kind of interesting? Uh, yeah, here comes the Buddha and says, this is the most basic one, I'll teach you straight away, and people don't follow these teachings. Uh, what you find, and this is the main problem that people do in meditation circles, is that they uh, tend to use too much force, uh, too much willpower, uh, too much pain. Yeah? Sit for one uh, an hour and a half, and if you get pain, just watch the pain, that kind of thing. Yeah? And the Buddha said, we shouldn't be doing that, because that is not the middle way. And yet somehow we have kind of, uh, uh, this is so somehow, this is so ingrained in the human psychology uh, that, you know, this is good to uh, deal with pain in this particular way. Uh, so we do that regardless, even though the Buddha said it's exactly what we should not do. Uh, so the idea of the middle way is the idea of not, on the one hand, uh, indulging in sensuality, uh, on the other hand, not torturing the body. Uh, now, here in the Kaduri Center, we're keeping eight precepts, Stella, is that right? Uh, yeah? Seven and a half? Uh, yeah, okay, the, the meal is a little bit late, so seven and a half, seven and three quarters precept, uh, because we're having the lunch a little bit after midday. But that's okay, it's not a big deal, because you have to, uh, you know, work with the circumstances. So, you're not going to be able to indulge too much in sensuality, unless you have your little secrets. Uh, have you got your little secret ways of indulging in <laughs> In sense pleasures, I don't, I don't know, whatever, you, you, you look after yourself, you are grown, grown enough to look after you, yourself. Uh, but basically, it's not a place where you can indulge too much. So don't worry too much about that side of things. Uh, it's already going to be difficult enough for you already, 
can't have a meal in the evening, yeah? It's not so easy because you're so used to it. So it's actually quite hard. It's much easier for me because I haven't had a meal in the evening for 25 years. I don't know what it's like to meet in the evening anymore. So for me, it's just natural. For you guys, much more difficult. Uh, so don't worry so much about that side. If you want to relax a little bit extra, have an extra cup of tea, if you want to go for a walk somewhere, if you just want to chill, you know, you know, just lie down or whatever, please do so. Do whatever works to make you feel relaxed and at ease. That is one of the most important things. What is far more problematic is the other side of the equation, the danger of tormenting yourselves too much. So please don't go down that track. Please don't think that you have to sit in a particular posture, full lotus for three hours, anything like that. Yeah. Please don't think that you uh, have to uh, never move in your meditation practice. Uh, please don't think that watching painful feelings is going to be all that useful. Uh, the Buddha doesn't really say it's all that useful. He says the middle way. Uh, so remember that. And when you remember that, uh, you will use the facilities here to the best of your uh, best of their potential. Use the chairs in the back. Yeah, are they good chairs in the back? Yeah. Comfortable? Yeah? Okay, comfortable, they say. Okay, so good chairs in the back. Yeah. They look quite nice, they have, they're have quite sturdy, yeah, and they're fairly straight. Yeah. So I think they're good and good chairs for meditation. So use those. Yeah. If you feel that you're getting too much pain in your legs, if your mind gets obsessed by the pain, goes back to the pain again and again, that's a sign there's too much pain. Yeah. Change your posture. Yeah. Yeah? Sit if you wish, lean against the wall if you like, uh, sit in a different way, uh, whatever it is that needs to be done to get another cushion. Uh, yeah? I don't know if you've seen some of these. Here everyone looks very restrained, you haven't got too many cushions. Uh, but in our retreat center in Jana Grove, uh, have you, any of you here been to Jana Grove before? Uh, yeah? Okay. Uh, Quite a few of you. you might, okay, so many times. Daydream has been there so many times. Okay, that's good. And what you, sometimes you see these people and they have ten cushions. Yeah, two under each knee, three under the bottom. You know, cushions here, cushions there. <laughs> and it's okay. Yeah, it's okay as long as you are comfortable, as long as you are at ease. That's what matters. Don't worry about the number of cushions. I'm not sure if you have enough cushions here, but that's that's okay. So you make use, but make use of the facilities, whatever they are. This is the first and su such an important thing. Uh, don't force yourself in this way. Because what happens if you do that? Uh, you get fed up with Buddhism. You think, oh, this Buddha, I didn't know what he was talking about. It's all pain. It's supposed to be happiness, but it's all pain. I'm out of here. See you. Uh, never, hope, to, hope to never see you again because uh, I, I hate Buddhism. And then you, it's terrible if that happens. Buddhism has such a massive potential to change your life for the better, uh, to make your life more meaningful, uh, uh, to give you uh, things that are really, really powerful and so useful in life. Uh, and if you get turned off by meditation practice, by forgetting the very first teaching of the Buddha, it's incredible, it's a great shame, uh, because all that potential is thrown out of the window. Uh, so please remember that. Uh, and uh, what happens, and this is kind of the beautiful thing, what happens when, when you do this, is that uh, when you don't have too much sensuality coming through the body, on the one hand, uh, you don't have too much pain coming through the body, uh, what that means is the body starts to become irrelevant. Uh, the body is only interesting because you get happiness through it. Yeah, You eat, you think, oh, that's really yummy. And of course, when it, something is really nice, then you attach to that and it becomes something that you hold on to. Uh, so you try not to get too much pleasure through the body. Uh, this is one of the things that we do on these retreats. This is why we keep the eight precepts. Uh, on the other hand, if you have too much pain in the body, again, the body becomes interesting. The mind goes to that pain. Why? Because the mind wants to resolve it. You want to get rid of it somehow. So by finding the middle way, the balance, where you neither indulge the body, nor do you have too much pain or you torture the body, the body becomes irrelevant. That is the good body. The good body is the body that disappears. Yeah, That's the only good body in Buddhism. So the good body is the body that disappears. So make sure that your body disappears a little bit. And the way to do that is this middle way, neither indulgence nor torturing yourself. And uh, this is so beautiful. And this is already a sense of peace and calm if you get that in the right way. So keep that in mind. And uh, if you do, uh, you may have a long and happy life as a Buddhist ahead of you. Huh? And if you forget that, your life as a Buddhist may end up being very short. Short, brutish and nasty, huh? as, uh, as someone said once about uh, the life of some, I think it was animals or something. Huh? But anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Huh? So once you get the 
body out of the way, then of course the next thing that kind of comes into focus is obviously going to be the mind, because only the mind remains uh, when the body disappears. Uh. So the, the quest, second question is always is, how do we deal with the mind? And um, the, uh, what the Buddha, again, has to say about dealing with the mind, one of the very important things in meditation practice uh, is to learn to be passive. Uh. Yeah, you may have heard about passive awareness. Uh, you may have heard Ajahn Brahm talking about being the passenger on the train. Uh, yeah, heard of passenger on the train simile? Uh, the idea, uh, uh, you got get on the train, uh, you know, you have the uh, underground, uh, the M, what's it called, MRT here in Singapore? MTR, MRT, that's, that's in Singapore, here it's called MTR, okay, MTR. So you get on the train, uh, yeah, ideally overground, uh, and uh, when you are, when you sit on the train, uh, you sit back, you lean back, yeah. Uh, and you watch out of the window, uh, and you just watch things passing by. Yeah, you don't try to tell the driver where to go. Have you ever t gone to the driver and t told him where to go? You can't do that. Yeah, if you do that, you get kicked off the train from place. So you can't. You can't tell the driver where to go. Don't go here. I want to go this other place. So uh, you accept that the journey has to go to a certain destination because if you go on the MTR, the tracks are already there, you don't have much choice, it only goes in one direction, you can't go anywhere else anyway, unless you have psychic powers or something. So you follow the track and you accept that. And so you sit back and you relax and you watch whatever is in the window. Whatever comes in the window as you look outside, you watch that and you allow that to be. You don't get involved. You don't try to change. You don't do anything about it. You are passive. You are a passive observer. You are a passenger on a train. So imagine yourself in the meditation practice to be a passenger on the train. Yeah. You sit back, and when you sit back on the train, you usually relax, yeah? You don't actually, you actually really relax. You don't try to hold yourself in a particular posture or anything like that. You really relax, and then you are passive, and you allow the scenery to go by. So see if you can be like a train passenger, yeah? And of course, the scenery in you have in meditation practice is much more interesting than the scenery on the MTR. Scene with the MTR, you know, you go through a tunnel or whatever, maybe sometimes you go overground. Uh, it's not that exciting, yeah? You see the same old buildings, the same old skyscrapers or whatever here in Hong Kong, maybe a little bit of greenery. In meditation, on, on the other hand, if you get it right, scenery is very exciting. Why? Because it's all happiness, it's all about joy, it's all about peace, it's all about these wonderful things uh, when it starts to work in the right way. So just sit back, yeah? allow the breath to develop by itself. Uh, Allow the peace to come to you. Don't go and chase the peace. Allow the peace to come to you instead. Just like the scenery in the MTR comes to you, in the same way you allow the peace to come to you. You're sitting back, allowing things to happen to you, rather than actually trying to make them happen. You see the difference there? And what is so interesting about this is that if you read the same sutta I was just talking about before, a sutta is a discourse of the Buddha, Yeah, if you don't know, and uh, if you read that, the Buddha says that all of these steps of happiness I was just talking about, uh, they don't happen through an act of willpower. You don't make them happen. Uh, the Buddha says, na chetanaya karaniya. And na chetanaya karaniya means, means not to be done by intention, not to be done by willpower. These are things that happen. Dhammata, they are dhammata. Dhammata means that they happen according to nature. That's what dhammata means. This is a natural process. If it is a natural process and you try to make it happen, you can't make a natural process happen. It has to happen by itself. Ajahn Brahm has this really nice, nice little simile that Ajahn Brahm uses. He says like if trying to get a natural process to happen faster than it can happen is like going to a little flower. Yeah, a little flower is coming out of the ground and then you get impatient. Grow faster, flower! I want to see you flowering properly. Come on, grow! And you get impatient, and you grab the flower, and you try to pull it to make it grow faster. Huh? Yeah, that is ends up, it's called disaster, because of course it doesn't work like that. And that is exactly the same idea as trying to make your meditation happen. It's exactly the same thing. You're pulling that flower, and it ends up in disaster rather than ending up in actually working. So don't pull that flower. Yeah, care for the flower instead. When you care for the flower, that's when the flower grows. That's when it starts to blossom, bloom, and become a beautiful flower eventually. But if you pull it, you're going to destroy the flower, and you will destroy the whole meditation practice. 
practice as a consequence. So care for the meditation practice. Caring is the right way here. Have a sense of metta for the breath. Have a sense of kindness for the breath. Have a sense of kindness for yourself and everyone else. When you care, that's when it works. So you care, you are passive. Na chetanaya karaniya. This is not to be done with willpower. It is a natural process and you allow it to happen by itself. Yeah, this is the right way of doing meditation practice. It is not so easy. It is not so easy because we are such compulsive doers. Yeah? And you will see that in a meditation practice. You will start thinking about things. Do you think you're going to start thinking about things? It's pretty quite likely, yeah, because we tend to think so much. It's very difficult just to be sit there completely peacefully without thinking. But if you get it right and you just pull back a little bit and you allow things to be here, then actually the peace will eventually come. And part of this is the idea of being patient. Be very patient, yeah, because when you are remembering, when you come from work, you come from a stressful environment or whatever, the mind is already revved up, going a hundred miles an hour. It takes a while for the mind to calm down. Again, dhammata, according to nature. Yeah? So allow the mind to calm down by itself. Uh, give your mind a break, yeah? Have compassion for your mind. Understand that the mind is not something you can control. The mind is something that operates according to cause and conditions. So you just have to allow those causes to work themselves out, and then it will happen by itself. So you stand back, you are patient, and you care. And when you kind of work these things together, then things really start to calm down. And what you will see when that happens, is that mindfulness starts to arise. Yeah, mindfulness starts to become uh, powerful because you are allowing things to be, you're not kind of uh, 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 adding fuel to the fire, kind of trying to make things be in a certain way. Instead, you're step stepping back. Yeah? You're taking the uh, foot off the ac accelerator in your car or in your mind or whatever, uh, and things start to calm down by themselves. Uh. And when p things calm down, mindfulness starts to arise. Uh. You feel more present. Uh. You feel more aware of what is going on around you. Uh. It's a natural consequence of just allowing things to calm down in this way. Uh. Yeah, and when you see the mindfulness arises, it's such a that already is very nice, already very beautiful. Uh. And this is the right way to make mindfulness arise in your, uh, in your practice. Uh. So one of the great little suttas that I always enjoy is a very simple little sutta. Uh, it is called the Bad Ekarata Sutta, Majjhimarika 131. Uh, and uh, it is a sutta on one auspicious night, Bad Ekarata Sutta. And um, uh, this is a very simple sutta. It says that you should not this is about how to establish mindfulness, really. Uh, you should not run into the past. Uh, you should not have expectations for the future. Uh, but you should have this uh, uh, vipassati. Vipassati means like to see clearly. You should see clearly into the Pachupanna Dhamma. Pachupanna Dhamma are the uh, things that are here right now. Yeah, the presently arisen things. Uh. And uh, the Buddha says in this verse that because why is that? Well, because in the past is already gone. It's finished. Uh, the future is unreliable and uncertain. Uh. Yeah? So we put those aside, uh, and when you put those aside, uh, that is when mindfulness becomes even stronger. Uh. So this is about having the right attitude. Now we're moving into the idea of having the right kind of attitude for your meditation practice. Uh. So remember that, the past is gone. Uh. Forget about it. Uh. There's nothing more to hold on to there. Uh. It's already done. Uh. Why do people hold on to the past? Well, one of the reasons people hold on to the past is because there is something that they did or someone did to them, yeah? And you feel, maybe you feel bad or maybe you feel that someone has treated you badly or whatever. So, of course, then a little bit of forgiveness is very powerful. Forgive yourself, forgive other people. And I will talk more about this later on, how to do this in an effective way so that you can let go of the past. Another thing, pe reason why people think about the past is because sometimes they think something was nice in the past. They think, oh, the past was so nice. How come my life is so miserable now and I was so good in the past? Yeah? Sometimes people think like that. But actually, if you are here, yeah, if you are serious about your meditation practice, you are moving towards something better. So forget about the past. Now you are on the right track. Now you are where you want to be. This is really where it's all at. The past, let it go. 
the future. Very often we think about the future because we want to control the future. We want to anticipate things. We want to sort things out in our heads so we can kind of make, get things right when we get there. Uh, but very often all of that uh, trying to sort things out in our head before we get there often is a waste of time uh, because it turns out the future actually is very different from what we thought it was. Uh, and a far more powerful way of understanding the future than to think about it uh, is to calm yourself down and that clarity of mind that we get from calming down is far more powerful in terms of wisdom uh, to understand how to deal with the future than trying to think about it. Uh. Yeah, I have always found with myself, when I try to think about what to do next, uh, I always mess it up because my mind is thinking this way and that way and you can't really, you don't have any clarity about it. Uh, but when I sit back and I just close my eyes uh, and I allow myself to become peaceful, uh, then suddenly it's almost as if the insight or the understanding of what you have to do, it just comes out, you know, like a miracle, bang, comes out. Oh yeah, now I know what to do. Uh, yeah. Has that happened? Does that happen to you sometimes? Uh, when you when you least expect to find a solution to a problem, it comes by itself. Yeah, it's like suddenly you know what is the right thing. Uh, it's weird when you think about it too much. It's almost like you are trapped in a certain loop of thought that uh, stops you from being able to see things with fresh eyes. Uh, but when you let go of all of that and all you do is just sit back and relax, suddenly the insight comes to you. Uh, so if you want to resolve the future problems, don't think about it. Uh, just come to the present moment. Uh. So let go of the past, let go of the future. Uh. And as you do that, your mind gets established in the present moment. Uh. This is where all the action is. Uh. It is in the present that we create a good future for ourselves. Uh. The present that matters, uh. everything else is kind of a, a waste of time really. Uh. But don't worry if you think about the past and the future, yeah, it's going to happen anyway. Just try to guide your mind very gently in the right direction. Huh? So uh, this is the beautiful Pad Eka Ratta Sutta. If you want to look it up later on, I don't know if you are interested in reading the suttas. If you are, uh, you can ask some of the sutta experts in the, uh, in the crowd here, people like Gerald. Uh, Della, do you read the suttas? Uh? No, not really. Okay. <laughs> so many years we come to suttas, just don't read the suttas. Oh, I've got so much work to do. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm being naughty. I apologize. But <laughs> so, but I know Gerald. He knows the suttas really well, and I'm sure the Bikunis here know the suttas really well as well. Yeah? So they can always uh, guide you a little bit. Uh. So this is uh, how then you let go of the past and the future. And a very important part of all of this, uh, all of the ability to let go of the past and the future, the ability to stay with the breath, uh, is the attitude that we have in the present moment. Attitude is so important uh, for meditation to work. Uh. So I'll give you a little bit of guidance on uh, the right kind of attitude to have. Uh, you may have noticed when I started out, I talked about the Kaduri Center here being such a beautiful place, uh, yeah? So remember, when you come here, the right attitude to have towards the Kaduri Center is not to be fault-finding. Uh. Every place is going to have faults. Yeah? There's always going to be faults, there's always going to be problems. Don't look at the problems. Uh. Look at the good things about this place. Uh. Yeah, it is uh, in the countryside, it is beautiful and green. Uh, it is quite quiet, yeah. If, you, if I just shut up for a minute, uh, Beautiful, isn't it? Uh, and this is, you indulge in the good aspects of the Kaduri Center. You focus on that. Uh, and when you focus on the good aspects, you see the positive in things, ar things around you. That is when you have the right attitude. Uh. Also, one of the wonderful things on coming on the retreat like this, and I say this every time I come on these retreats, uh, remember that the people who are here with you uh, are really good people. Uh. Nobody would bother coming on a retreat like this unless they were a good person. Uh, why would you voluntarily come and keep all these precepts? Uh, why would you voluntarily come and you know, have to sit on your bottom for many hours every day for, for, for no real reason, unless you had some higher aspiration, unless you had some kind of good intention in your life? Uh, everyone who is here are beautiful people. Yeah? Remember that. Uh, and when you remember that, you have the right attitude towards the people around you. Uh. Simple things like that. Enjoy the place. Uh, enjoy the people around you. Have a sense of metta and compassion for the people who are here. Uh. As you do that, treat them with kindness. Uh, that kindness that you do here and now will be very powerful in your meditation. Why? Because the kindness that you do very recently will affect your meditation the most. Uh. 
you will remember that and it will boost your sense of well-being and happiness right here and now. Uh, do all of these things right, have that right attitude, uh, and as you do so, uh, you will find that actually things start to fall into place. Uh, suddenly, watching the breath is so easy, uh, because you already feel positive, uh, you already feel happy to some extent. Uh, if you feel like you are a bit negative or whatever, uh, don't try too hard to do your meditation practice if you feel a bit negative. Instead, just walk around a little bit, have a cup of tea, lie down a little bit, think, well, you know, how can I think about this differently? So I, I'll talk about this more later on, how to think about things in such a way that we can let go of the negativity. Here. So you focus, you let go of that negativity first, uh, and only then, when you feel good about yourself, you feel right, then you sit down and you do your meditation practice. Uh, you try to find that balance first of all, uh, then the meditation is going to go well. Uh. Attitude, so important, so fundamental to the, the path. Uh, if you remember the Noble Eightfold Path, it starts off with right view, then you have like right intention, yeah, which has a lot to do with attitude, uh, then you have all the sila, and then you have the meditation later on. Uh. All of this comes in a certain sequence. Uh. So get the attitude right. Uh. Remember the kind things that you have done in life. Yeah? Sometimes you just sit back uh, and you think, yeah, I've been a Buddhist for so many years. Uh, I have lived on the five precepts for so many years. Wow, actually, that's quite good. Uh, we often forget about all the good things that we have done. Uh, yeah, I, it was very interesting because um, uh, Ajahn Brahm we had recently come out of the Rains Retreat at Bodhinana Monastery. You know about the Rains Retreat? Uh, every year we go for three months, uh, we have a retreat at a monastery. This is an ancient Indian tradition. All monastics, they have the Vassa. The Vassa is the, uh, uh, the rainy season and you go on a, uh, you stay in one place for those three months. Uh, and we always have a retreat at Bodhinana Monastery at that time. And Ajahn Brahm goes off to his kuti for two weeks and we don't see him for two weeks. Yeah? He just goes off and all you have left is the Vassa. Vibes, yeah, Ajahn Brahm vibes in the monastery here. And I have, I, I usually feed Ajahn Brahm, I usually put food in his bowl, yeah, this is my, my job. And I had, I had kind of got so used to doing it, I've completely forgotten that I've been doing this for so long here. Yeah. And this, one of the other monks told me, oh, you've been doing this for two decades, haven't you? Feeding Ajahn Brahm when he goes on a read. I thought, my goodness, you're right. Sometimes we forget about the things we do. And when I thought about that, I thought, wow, actually, what a wonderful thing that is, that I've been doing this for 20 years. I didn't get a big ego or anything, I just thought, wow, what a nice thing that is. Uh, yeah, we often we forget about the things that we have done. Uh, we forget that we have been living with care and compassion, keeping the five precepts or whatever it is for a long, long time. Uh, and what a wonderful thing that is, uh, that we have people who live with that kind of integrity in the world. Uh, so remember that. Uh, don't take these things for granted. Uh, use these things as a way of reflecting on your life. Uh, and as you do, that too will be supportive in your practice. Uh, it's called Sila Nusati, it's called in the Pali. Uh, you remember your, uh, your virtue and your kindness. Uh, so whatever you feel in your life has been good and positive and wholesome, uh, allow that to come into your mind so you can feel better in your meditation practice. Uh, all of these things are about attitude. So, uh, one last thing I'm going to mention, uh, just as a foundation for the meditation practice, uh, and that is what I like to call uh, the outlook, uh, the way to look at the world, the way to look at meditation practice. Uh, this is also very important for meditation really to become profound. Uh, our meditation is, uh, uh, is um, so conditioned by how we look at the world, how we think about things. Uh, yeah, if you think about it, wh what is the main difference between an arahant, a fully awakened person, and ordinary people? One of the most important differences is the outlook, the way they understand the world. Uh, an arahant will understand the world in terms of, he understand the suffering of the world, uh, the impermanence, the anicca of the world, uh, the non-self. They have a very different way of looking at things. Uh, so because of that, because of that outlook of the arahant, of the awakened person, because they see the world differently, uh, that is why they have such an ability in meditation practice. Uh, an arahant sits down, uh, yeah, and they go into jhana, bang, like that. Uh, there's nothing to stop them. Uh, and a very important part of that is the outlook, because they know uh, there's nothing really to hold on to in this world. Uh, they can go, let go very, very fast and very easily. Uh. So we also want to tap into that outlook a little bit. Uh, seeing the world, understanding the world in the right way. Uh, yeah? And as you 
do that. You, uh, your attitude changes. You understand where real happiness is to be, f be found. Uh, and it's much more easy to let go of all the false happinesses of the world uh, because you know that there's no real happiness to be found uh, in the long run. Uh. And this is one of the reasons why, again, we're going to be looking at the suttas, uh, why we're going to be uh, see what the Buddha has to say about these things, uh, because this is how we condition ourselves uh, into getting right view. Uh. Yeah, conditioning is just a nice way of saying brainwashing here. Yeah? yeah, so I hope, are you ready to get brainwashed? Uh? Adam Brown, who told me we should get brainwashed, yeah, so I, 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 <laughs> so I, I, this is, I think, one of Adam Brown's teachings, the brainwashing teaching here, yeah, how to, how everyone has to get, it has a nice double meaning, because brainwashed means you change your attitude, yeah, but it also means you clean yourself out, get rid of all those defilements, uh, kind of nice double meaning here, you clean out the defilements, brainwashing, but you also get, you know, changed your attitude, yeah. So uh, it's kind of scary when people say you're going to get brainwashed, but actually it's good uh, because remember, you are brainwashed anyway. Uh, you have no choice to, uh, but to be brainwashed. Uh, why is that? Because that's what happens to us. We are in society, we learn certain things, we learn things from our teachers, whoever it is. Uh, every attitude we have is really a brainwashing. Uh, so you just have to choose the right kind of brainwashing. Uh, that's what it's about. Uh, choose your brainwashing carefully. Uh, and if you choose your brainwashing carefully, then you're on the right track. Yeah. That is what really matters. Yeah. So, atti not attitude, I'm, I'm talking about outlook now, is so important. Yeah. If you have the right outlook, if you understand that this, uh, when you come on a meditation retreat, uh, when you sit down and you watch your breath, uh, when you become peaceful, uh, when you start to get some joy and happiness in your meditation practice, uh, some of you will get that, some of you won't. Uh, that's okay. But if you get that, you start to feel that now you are moving towards the very meaning of life itself. That's what it feels like. Yeah. Yeah? And when you start to move towards the meaning of life, that starts to change your outlook in a very dramatic way. Yeah? Because it means that all of the other things that were important to you, they start to become less important. Yeah, if you have found the meaning of life, well, obviously the other things cannot be the meaning of life. Uh, so you change your, your uh, entire priority, priorities. Uh, you prioritize in a different way. What you value in the world is different. Uh, now you start to value the meditation practice. You prioritize that. Uh, and because you value it and you prioritize it, uh, it means that it is so much easier to become peaceful. Uh. And this is why right view is the very first factor on the Noble Eightfold Path. It starts off at the beginning because right view informs the whole path, including the meditation itself. So uh, this is what this is about, understanding where real meaning, uh, real happiness, uh, real, uh, you know, these things are to be found. Uh, and as you do that, you reprioritize. Uh, it's easy to forget and, and let go of the ordinary life, uh, and easy to become peaceful and calm in your meditation practice uh, as a consequence. Uh, so outlook. Uh, and uh, I will talk more about that later on as well as we go through this retreat. Uh. So, that is a little bit of uh, background information for you. Uh, and uh, remember that some of the most important things here, just to summarize the important things, I've been talking a lot already, uh, uh, is just to, first of all, just to uh, find the ease of the body. Uh, yeah, uh, Don't allow yourself to be tortured too much. Uh, or whatever, uh, and then allow yourself a lot of time, a lot of patience in your meditation practice uh, by allowing things to calm down. Try to be that passenger on the train, uh, yeah, who doesn't do anything but allows things to happen in the right way. Uh, and as you do that, it becomes very nice, uh, very beautiful, very natural, uh, and very easy. Uh, and this is really where we want to be and where we want to go. Uh. So, that is just a little bit about meditation practice. Uh, and um, uh, I think I'm gonna, we're going to do a little bit of meditation together afterwards, if you wish. Yeah, remember, you don't have to be here if you don't want to, but if you want to, you are welcome to uh, continue. Uh, but let's have a little break, first of all, maybe 10 minutes or so. So let's meet back here about 10 past 8, and we'll do the meditation together.